All right, so let's begin this whole process by starting to think about physics in a way that is conducive to understanding general relativity. And of course, when I say that, I mean this is how it worked for me, or and work to the extent that I am familiar with this. I mean, I'm not certainly any more knowledgeable about this than many. This is just the way I like to think about uh, things in order to align with the nature of the subject very well. And I think this is a great way of doing it. And it has to do with thinking in terms of world lines. I think world lines is really, there's a lot of information to extract just by really getting a sense of how world lines work. For example, world lines are followed by test particles, right? And there's a lot of interesting information about what is a test particle. World lines exist in space-time, right? And that's an important jump to make from the notion of space and time to the notion of space-time. A lot of that should have been done in special relativity. And um, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, the world line is sort of the, the foundational concept, in my opinion, to get to what I find it to be the most interesting thing, uh, well, in the elementary form of rel general relativity, which is geodesics, uh, geodesics, geodesics. So let's see, if, let's see how much we can extract from the world line as sort of a concept to, to get us thinking in terms, uh, uh, mentally, in terms of general relativity, in terms of special relativity. And the, the, the key issue is to get that time axis, to get that x0 axis right there in the forefront of your thinking. If you ever think of the motion of a particle and you don't think of it in terms of, of a time axis along with a space axis, you're hopelessly... Um, stuck in the detached Newtonian view, and you're never going to ever get a good conceptual grasp of general relativity. So this, this implies, for example, that when you think of the orbit of a planet around the sun, here's the sun, or a star, and you think of the orbit of a planet around it, if your picture is like this, then you're never going to get anywhere in this subject. Um, the picture that you need to have for a planet orbiting the sun is a picture that looks like like this. You put that orbit in a plane. You put that the sun at a point in the plane. The sun is just the sun has a path through space-time that is a straight line because we are going to be this do this in the uh, uh, coordinate system where the sun is motionless, and this planet orbits the sun, let me just do a solid line, the planet orbits the sun like this. And that is the way you need to view orbits around a sun. You could also do a flyby orbit, right, a flyby orbit would look something like this. where um, uh, some object is, some test particle is moving towards the star and then moving away from the star. But all pictures of motion from now on, I want you never to have any motion that's only understood in terms of space. From now on, everything has to corkscrew cork screw through time or just fly by through time. And... Time has to be part of the actual geometric picture. If you don't do that, none of this is ever going to make real good sense. If you do do it, it's going to make sense pretty darn fast, actually. One of the things that helps uh, uh, with this whole picture is now uh, is understanding that you have to be moving. In this picture, you must, must be moving. You can't stand still in a, a, picture, a geometric picture of space-time because standing still would be implying never leaving that spot. There's a spot right there. It's at location x0, x1, x2, and x3. And if you're at that spot, and you're never moving from that spot in space-time, that basically means x0 is frozen, right? Because it happens at an instant in time. 
And time never stops, right? The best you can do is apply all of that movement into the time-like direction, right? But you must be moving through time. And that's a really interesting point. Say everything's moving through time and you're all standing still relative to each other. So you've got all, say you've got several guys that are, there's no real relative motion, but everybody's moving through time. Um, how fast? How fast are you moving through time? How quickly is this point or is this particle moving through space-time? I mean, the sun is just sitting there moving through time. You can imagine another sun, maybe this guy, and it's moving through time. Well, they should both be moving through time at exactly the same rate. Now, if there's no relative motion, if there's no relative motion between these two stars, then special relativity tells us that, yes, their proper time is the same. It's, you can synchronize it, and it will stay synchronized. So what is that speed that two things who are not in relative motion move through time with? And understanding that we are measuring um, uh, distance in terms of uh, uh, time in terms of meters, that speed is the speed of light. There's only one possible speed. What else could it be? It has to be the speed of light. That's the only universal constant available to us. And so everything moves through time at the speed of light. And so that's kind of a, a, a fascinating way of looking at the universe, especially just listening to this lecture. You're sitting there listening to this lecture. You are moving through the speed of light at sea. And if you're just picturing yourself sitting still, you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. I'm telling you to picture everything moving through time at the speed of light. Things that are standing still relative to you, your book, this, the, the, maybe the mobile device you're watching this on, you know, everything is moving at the speed of light through time. And you should actually think of it that way, right? You should think of yourself as flying through time at the speed of light and you're not standing still at all. The problem is, is that everything is traveling at the speed of light, not just you standing still, but this particle that's on this flyby trajectory around the sun, that thing is also moving along at the speed of light. It's moving along along this line at the speed of light. And this planet that's moving around the sun, it's also moving at the speed of light. It's moving along its world line at the speed of light. Every one of these particles, at every point on its trajectory through space-time, has a four-velocity. I'll call that the four-velocity. And it's the exactly the same four-velocity you learned about in special relativity. So there's a four-velocity at every one of these locations. There's a four-velocity for this sun that's standing still. There's a four-velocity for this flyby orbit, right? Um, there's uh, every, every point and every instant, there's this four velocity. And if I called those four velocity, say I called that V, right? The four, the four velocity at this point here, I called it V. We know from uh, special relativity, we know how to write down V. V is d x zero d tau d x one d tau d x two d tau d x three d tau. Right. Now we know that uh, d tau is the proper time. So the proper time is the time that's clicking off along the, in, on the clock attached to these test particles that are moving down these world lines. Now, I haven't specified quite yet that these world lines are free-falling, right? I haven't said that or said it specifically, but it doesn't have to be. What I'm saying is irrelevant of whether these lines are free-falling or not. This could actually be a rocket ship that is accelerating toward the sun not only because it's falling, but it's got its engines on or it's pulling away from the sun and it turns on its engines. It doesn't have to be a free-falling object. This guy going around the sun, let's say it is. The sun of self, of course, is just free-falling in basically empty space. The reason these guys are test particles moving around the sun is because they don't influence the sun. They don't supply gravity. All the gravity might be supplied by the sun. Although, I shouldn't even be invoking gravity yet. I mean, we haven't discussed it. I'm implying that this particle is moving in an orbit around the sun. Whatever keeps it in that orbit, it doesn't matter. 
all I can tell you is that it's following this trajectory in space-time. And, um, and as such, this is its four velocity. And all of these guys have a little clock on them, right? This is a test particle. What, what is a test particle? Let's talk about our test particle for a second. Our test particle, for the purposes of this course, will be some kind of little contained object that has a clock, which I'll draw as a little cesium atom, right? Cesium clock. And uh, an atom is an oscillator, right? So that's the oscillator for the clock. But a clock has to have an oscillator and a counter. So here's a little digital register that counts ticks of the clock. So that's the clock, right? And then um, what else does it have? Uh, so a test particle has a little clock on it. It's got a certain mass, right? A test particle has a certain mass. But that mass is very, 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 very small compared to everything else. It's so small that it doesn't cause any gravitational effect relative to the problem that you're studying. So that's its its mass is very, very tiny. So you've got a mass, but it's small. You've got a clock on it. Oh, and its its physical extent is very so very tiny that um, it doesn't experience any internal stresses or strains due to gravitational tidal forces, which, and we'll talk about that a little later. You can put that in your memory bank for now. Internally, it has no stresses or strains, measurable stresses or strains due to tidal forces. And when we talk about tidal forces, um, uh, I'll do, do that in a lot more rigorous detail. So that's what a test particle is. Also, test particles, generally speaking, should have the ability to just emit a burst of light, right? So they should have some kind of lamp attached to it, I guess, right? So it should be a lamp on every spot so it can it, it can emit a little sphere of light. So it can emit a, a spherical light wave front. In flat space, it would be a perfectly spherical wave front going in all directions. That's what a test particle is. Anyway, so these test particles have this, um, uh, this four velocity, and that tau in the denominator, this tau is the proper time, which is measured by the clock on the test particle. So we've seen this before. And um, we can break it down, right? We just take these derivatives, so the lab frame time or the coordinate time, with respect to the coordinate time, times the coordinate time with respect to the proper time. I know that looks silly, but that's because of our units, actually. Um, then the space time with respect to the coordinate time the coordinate time respect to the proper time, and the other space-time coordinates in a similar fashion, and then for dx3 too, right? dx3, dx0, dx0, d tau, and this is all special relativity, right? This is all our basic course where this guy here we call gamma, that's the gamma factor. And of course, in our units, this is simply 1. Um, if, in alternative units, this would be CT, right? That would be a CT here. So this would end up being C, this DX. Uh, this would be a, in, in, in alternative units, this would be DCT DT. So that's how you may have seen it in your special relativity course, where so you end up with a, a factor of C. But in our case, C is 1, and, and we don't have to deal with that. One of the nice reasons of choosing the C equals 1 set of units. So we end up with gamma uh, V1, gamma V2, gamma, mm, gamma V3, like that. That is our 4 velocity. I'll put a, give a little vector up there. That's our 4 velocity for basically any particle, right? You give me v1, v2, and v3, I give you a 4 velocity. So you go anywhere on this world line, anywhere on this world line, specify v1, v2, and v3, and you end up with um, this 4 velocity. And the uh, velocity that goes into the gamma, because remember, I guess there's a bit of a review now, right? Gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared. Um, in many textbooks, this when you use the units where c equals 1, uh, you end up with this is a beta instead of a v, and beta is defined as v over c. So if your units are not uh, c equals 1, 
then you just take the ratio of V to C, you get beta, and uh, you end up with um, 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. But our unit C is 1, so we don't have to bother with that process, right? I'm just saying this because different people come from special relativity with different formats, right? So we just go with this expression for gamma. And V is the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared, right? This is where exponents and um, uh, subscripts get confusing. So, um, so this is the definition of our four velocity, but let's work this out a little bit. What is the magnitude of the four velocity? The magnitude of the four velocity is the magnitude of v mu, v mu, like that, which is going to be eta, alpha, beta, v, alpha, v, beta, right? This is the, our uh, special relativity Minkowski metric, which we're always going to use as minus 1, 1, 1, 1, right? That's our choice. Our choice of the Minkowski metric is minus 1, 1, 1. That's the flat space-time metric of special relativity. And so when we do this calculation, we will get, let's see, negative gamma squared. Well, uh, it's all going to be a magnitude, right? So it's negative gamma squared plus uh, uh, gamma squared v1 squared plus gamma squared v2 squared plus gamma squared v3 squared, which is going to equal minus gamma squared, uh, well, no, gamma squared 1 minus uh, v1 squared plus v2, oops, I'm running out of space, plus v2 squared plus v3 squared, right? And that's going to equal, uh, that's going to equal gamma, oops, there's a minus one, that's a minus one right there, right? It's going to be gamma squared over, um, or gamma squared, and it's going to be uh, uh, basically v, the magnitude of the uh, velocity, minus 1. And, well, what is gamma? So, so let me bring it up here. But gamma squared is 1 over 1 minus v squared. And then the numerator of this thing is v squared minus 1. v squared minus 1 is in the numerator. So that whole thing equals negative 1, but we're taking the magnitude, right? So it equals 1, which of course is the speed of light, right? The speed of light is 1 in our units. Huh. The point is, is that the magnitude of, the, of, the, of an arbitrary velocity, of an arbitrary 4 velocity, is always c, right? Which is what I was saying you just sitting still are traveling at the speed of light. If you're sitting still, you've got gamma, zero, zero, zero is your four velocity, but the magnitude of your spatial velocity is zero, so gamma equals one, and the magnitude of this thing is gonna be, oh, well, it's gonna be one. So you're traveling at the speed of light all the time. And that's the, that's the thing you gotta think about. Nothing is stationary in general relativity. Nothing sits still. It's impossible to be motionless. You can talk about being motionless relative to something, I suppose, but as far as any form of space-time measurement, meaning you have any kind of coordinate system, everything is moving in that coordinate system along a world line. Nothing is stationary. And furthermore, furthermore, what's even more interesting is that no matter what world line you're on, no matter what world line you're on, you're always traveling at the speed of light. You're always traveling at C, or in our units, 1. And so that's a pretty profound idea, um, that nothing is uh, stationary in this business. And so that's uh, uh, an important way of starting to think about general relativity, because we're going to be building these world line constructions, and 
uh, we're going to squeeze space three space dimensions down into two so we can visualize it like this. That's not too hard because we'll have enough symmetry in our problems that that's okay. Um, there are problems that I I'd love to get into involving Kerr black holes where you can't really do it. Um, you can't really squeeze everything down into two dimensions. So then you have to kind of imagine, well, how do you picture, how do you picture something in three dimensions? Like, uh, you know, if we have our, uh, a chunk of space, right? Here we have a chunk of space. How do we imagine this chunk of space um, uh, moving through this chunk of space in all three dimensions, some arbitrary movement in this chunk of space? How do we imagine that world line? Because we can't add a time dimension. I've seen people try different things. I've seen people try coloring, right? They'll start with blue, and then as it goes on and on, they'll, it'll turn. As time marches on, the, the line kind of changes color. You know, all right. I've seen people try to do it where shrinking, uh, uh, you know, shrinking is what, you know, imagining, you're imagining this, this cube, this is the cube at one time, right? And then you imagine at a later time, the cube is this little thing, and it's kind of shrinking, and that, that shrinkage is the time dimension, right? This would actually... This actually looks like something that people would call a tesseract, tesseract, you know, this four-dimensional cube. It's sort of got that four dimension. This is really, really not worth the trouble, I, I don't think. I don't think it's worth your trouble trying to imagine that fourth dimension. But there's a lot of times where something like that might be useful. But for now, we're okay, because we're going to be able to squeeze our four time dimensions into, into two space dimensions and then one time dimension. So we're not going to have too much trouble with that. All right, so this world line concept, that's one big important thing I want you to think about. So the next thing is sort of one of these fundamental postulates ideas is that we're going to be talking about, let's imagine we have this world line, right? I'll, I'll stick to my sort of orbiting. I, I'm not even sure that that's a really good orbit. I think an orbit is better understood like this, right? You have this sort of orbiting object in our space-time, right? And there it is. That's its world line. There's coordinates on this space-time. Remember how we drew, drew in the What is a Tensor series? We drew coordinates like this, and I said, call that x0 and x1. And the very fact that you can do that, right, the very fact that this is possible, that if I say this is, my, this is symbolically representing space-time, s, I can actually go into space-time and draw coordinates on space-time. And... The fact that that's possible, right, that I can put four coordinates on space-time, that means that space-time is a manifold. And that is kind of an assumption of our mathematical structure of the theory. We're assuming that we can lay down coordinates on space-time, and that space-time is actually a manifold, and the four coordinates are x0, x1, x2, and x3. And um, this, can, this process can actually be done. Let me uh, erase this guy for a second. Um, the implication of this, of course, is since it's a manifold, we know that what we really have is we really have some R4 out there. And if this region of space-time is some chart you, remember we were giving the charts U alpha was their name, then this mapping from R4, which has this coordinate grid, that mapping is the inverse of the chart mapping, laying down these coordinates into space-time. So when I draw this thing, when I draw this thing, and I say, okay, here's our x0, and here's our x1, and here is our x2 axis, this thing here, this thing here, is meant to be this. It's meant to be space-time with coordinate lines laid down through this inverse mapping from some R4. That's what this is. This here is space-time, and these lines I've drawn here are supposed to be these little 
this thing I've been symbolically talking about in the manifold lectures. So this is actually like a, a realization, an instant of this. And so there's some other R4 out here. There's some other R4. Oops, why can't I draw? There's some other R4 out here that's mapping into this region with some kind of inverse mapping and laying down these coordinate lines. I'll put those coordinate lines in blue. The coordinate lines are like this. And then, so the x0 coordinate lines, the x1 coordinate lines, the x2 coordinate lines. And, uh, and it's chopping up and dividing up and, and slicing up space-time. So space-time is a manifold. And therefore, if space-time is a manifold, we have kind of all of those tools that we were talking about before, right? If I'm now going to say this is a path through space-time, well, it's a path. It's a curve. Well, what's a curve? A curve in a manifold, since space-time is a manifold, I'm not even going to draw the coordinates. Or I'll do this. I'll draw these little coordinates, right? x1, x2, uh, x0. Time, the time-like coordinate will always be 0. We'll discuss what distinguishes a time-like coordinate from the space-like coordinates a little later. But, but uh, if this is a curve, and this is, here is, here is our space-time manifold, and here's a path in space-time, and there's a test particle that's following this path, presumably. In other words, this path is modeling the motion of a test particle in general relativity. Well, what does this mean from our manifold perspective? Well, I have some interval on R1 and a parameter beta, and I have a map from that parameter into space-time. And that map is going to be called x alpha, and I'll put the parameter in there as beta. It's a function of beta. So for every value of beta, I can create a point in the manifold whose coordinate is x alpha. And as beta moves from 0 to 1, this test particle moves from x alpha of 0 ultimately to x alpha of 1. And every value of beta in here, this mapping will now plot the location or the coordinates of this test particle at all of these different points. So this might be x alpha of 0.5, right, for example. And when I look at x alpha, of course, I'm thinking of x0 of 0.5, x1 of 0.5, x2 of 0.5, and x3 of 0.5. Right? And that is how we understand a path in space-time. It is parameterized as a curve on a manifold. And, and um, uh, that tells us quite a lot, right? I mean, once we have a curve in space-time, we can now talk about tangent vectors on that curve, just as they, we have in the previous lesson, uh, lessons about uh, tangent vectors. And um, we can also talk about the length of this curve. And we're going to do that. We're going to talk about the length of this curve in space-time. But uh, the point I'm trying to get now is, before we go into those specifics, is that space-time is a manifold. And that's a uh, basically an assumption of the theory, right? The theory leans on that mathematics of being a manifold. And so, uh, now this there's a little potential for confusion here, I think, and... Um, I'm not sure I've ever really resolved it myself, but understanding that if space-time is a manifold, right, here's our manifold of space-time. Remember, a manifold requires that, okay, this region has a chart to R4, and every region has a chart to R4 if we are dealing with a four-dimensional manifold. Now, notice that says nothing about the metric, right? Being a manifold does not tell you anything about the metric. Sometimes you'll see people say that because space-time is a manifold, every little region of space-time locally must look like uh, a Lorentzian, a Lorentzian flat space-time, and that's I don't think that's the right way to look at it. It is true that every local piece of space-time looks Lorentzian, and that's going to be the last point we make um, in this first lesson. But all this says is that a, every region of our manifold has to have 
coordinates in four dimensions. Now, in addition to that, it turns out that there's another assumption of the theory that does get you this far, and we'll talk about that. But just because it is a manifold doesn't mean anything about the metric. Um, all it means is that you can lay down coordinates, and it's a differentiable manifold, right, uh, in the sense that you can, the transition functions are all differentiable functions, just like we learned about in the what is a manifold lecture. So the key assumption that we're dealing with, though, is that space-time is a four-dimensional manifold. Now, on top of that, then there is the first principle that's actually really important. And we'll cover that as our last subject for today. And today it's called the Einstein Equivalence Principle, the EEP. And the EEP is usually, I think it's worth talking about because it's, I don't like the way it's presented in books when I learned about it because the presentation doesn't get you to sort of the mathematical modeling of it. But the typical presentation is this guy in an elevator. And I, really, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I totally get it that, you know, you have a guy in an elevator and he's basically the elevator is in open space. It shouldn't even be an elevator. Just say a guy in a box, right? And he's just floating in open space. There's no gravity. There's no earth. There's nothing. He's just floating there. And um, if you start accelerating the block very smoothly, and like sometimes they'll put a little rocket engine on it saying that this rocket engine is providing a constant force, um, metered very carefully so that the acceleration is constant, right? And so once he does that, then our little guy is no longer floating. He's now standing in the elevator. And the key is, is that as long as this acceleration is constant, and let's actually say it's acceleration of gravity, it's 1g of acceleration, then that this is indistinguishable there's no experiment that can be performed inside this little box that distinguishes it from the situation of a guy standing in a box on the surface of the earth, right, where this is the earth, right? And, and the Einstein equivalence principle um, basically is various versions of this moving rocket elevator situation that covers a variety of different situations. And um, the, uh, the, the key one of this, so, so this, one, this one here, this, this particular uh, thought experiment shows that uniform acceleration is indistinguishable from a gravitational field locally, meaning if this box is small enough, and we'll talk about it being big enough in a moment. But it also means that a person floating in free space in absolutely empty space, right? Little little guy in a box in free empty space, that that is indistinguishable from, or or a guy in a box moving with uniform velocity v. How about that? Guy floating in a box using uniform velocity v, he he can't distinguish, he can't be distinguished from a guy freely falling in a gravitational field. So a guy who's freely falling under the influence of gravity has no way of knowing if he's not in a box just moving along, if he's not in a box where there is or isn't any gravity. He can't detect. There's nothing that he can do to detect the existence of the local presence of the Earth accelerating him, short of a non-local experiment. For example, if he looked out the window and sh looked at the Earth and saw it there, or shown a beam of a laser beam to the Earth and reflected it back, and kept track of his relative motion with the Earth, you know, he could do that. But that's non-local, right? That's non-local. Locally, that means inside this little box, there's really no experiment he could perform to decide if he was in a, in a, uh, in a, um, uh, uh, in the field, in a gravity field, or if he was just floating out in space. So the question is, is what is local? What is local? And this is a pretty important question because you can certainly imagine this circumstance, right, where here's the Earth. I'll just make a funny, or, or here's a large, massive object that's clearly gravitating, very dense, massive object. And um, there's two, uh, the, this is a very kind of standard picture, by the way. And there's two test particles that are falling, and we know that they're going to fall 
towards the center of the object. And what's evident by this picture is that the distance between these two test particles, right, it gets smaller because they're both going to the same spot. So in principle, if our box, if the box that I was talking about, that the lab that was covering this, was this big, you clearly will sit in the lab, and as the lab falls and the balls fall, you will see the balls get closer and closer together. It'd be like sitting in a lab looking at two balls that just tended to come together, right? They're actually, the distance between them, get, it's like they're attracting each other. Right? That's what it'll look like to you. It'll look like to you as though those two balls are attracting each other. That's what it'll look like to this guy right here who's with the lab. He'll think these balls are just attracting each other. And clearly, once he sees that, he'll recognize, wait a minute, I must be in this circumstance. I must be in this circumstance, and therefore I am in a gravitational field. So there's an experiment he could do to determine that he was in a gravitational field. If he was not in a gravitational field, if he was just floating way out in space then those two balls would just sit there in the lab far apart from each other and he wouldn't notice any change. But because he sees these balls coming together, he knows he's in a gravitational field. So we can't have that. So what do we do? Well, we shrink the lab. But obviously that problem, you know, if you shrink the lab, well, that doesn't really change anything. I mean, the balls are still going to, you know, starting in two different places, they're still going to the same place. They're still, they're still going to get closer together. So as long as you can detect it, you can shrink the lab more and more and more until you can no longer detect it. And it really has to do with the quality of your, your measuring devices, right? If you have a measuring device that is so precise that it can take two balls one centimeter apart and an earth that's a thousand miles away, right? Well, a thousand miles away, say, a million miles away, right? Really far away. If you're so good that you can, you can detect the slight, slight uh, drift of these balls together due to the tidal forces in that situation, well then, you're not local, right? Local is sort of this relative to, it's always local relative to your ability to measure. And the higher your precision of measuring, the more, um, the, the, the smaller your lab has to be. Right? So if th this situation is too big, you've got to just get smaller. So the point is about this is that um, nature will always beat your measuring equipment. Right? There's no level at which your measuring equipment is so precise that, um, uh, that nature you can't imagine a smaller lab. It's a limiting process. It's an epsilon delta type limiting process. You set up how precise your ability to measure is and nature will find an epsilon uh, laboratory size that will beat your measuring apparatus. That's just the way it is. Um, Meister, Thorne, and Wheeler talks a lot about this, and it's pretty interesting. All you need to know is that local just means small enough that you can't detect this very process. You cannot detect this process. So, um, but, very well, but how does this implicate the theory, right? So we're going to go back to our notion of world lines. And we're going to talk about, you know, we're talking about world lines, but now imagine a freely falling, falling object in space-time. And I like to draw it like this because I always think of orbits, right? So here's an object just orbiting a star, and it's in free fall, right? It's in free fall. And free fall just simply means there's no other forces, there's no forces at all acting on it, right? Not even... Because gravity, we're not calling a force, right? Gravity is going to be this following of a geodesic trail in space-time, a little foreshadowing. But uh, a force would be an electromagnetic force, right? An electromagnetic force of some kind. Um, or failing electromagnetic force, perhaps uh, the strong force or the weak force, right? Um, so if it's none of those forces, then if there's none of those forces are in play the particle is free-falling. And it still could be accelerating, of course, because of gravity, but these forces are not acting on the particle at all. So the particle is free-falling, and um, uh, its path through space-time, 
its path through space-time is given by x alpha of some parameter. And uh, I'll call that parameter tau for now. Um, in our next lecture, we'll see why tau is going to be the proper time. But that param that this path, that is what this path is. It's uh, x alpha. And, and tau being the parameter, of course, that's just... That's just our uh, R1, right? Defining a curve, right? So tau is the parameter. And the point is, is that we're allowed to make coordinate transformations, right? We talked a lot about coordinate transformations uh, when we talked about a tensors. What is a tensor and how tensors change under coordinate transformations? And namely, the essence of a tensor doesn't change. But what the free-falling particle, the way this Einstein equivalent principle, all of this, all of this elevator stuff, the way it translates to our world line understanding, is it means no matter what world line you're on, and as long as it's free-falling, no matter what free-falling world line you're on, um, you can always do a, a coordinate transformation so that your coordinates at that point on the world line, that coordinates is Minkowski. They're Minkowski coordinates. Minkowski coordinates, right? You can always find a coordinate transformation that will place special the coordinate system of special relativity at your spot. And those coordinates are, that coordinate system will be free falling coordinates. They will be coordinates that are associated with your falling motion, and we, they're called geodesic coordinates. And um, they could also uh, 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 geodesic coordinates is what we're going to learn how to how to build them as geodesic coordinates. But the Einstein equivalence principle is this assumption. It's this it's this statement that anywhere on a free falling world line, you can take this coordinate system and say, screw it, I'm going to put up a coordinate system right here. At that particle, or I can, I'm going to establish a coordinate system such that at this point, at this point, we have Minkowski space time. And that's, and what that means is that means not only do you have four dimensions of coordinates, but you also have a metric at that point. That metric at that point is equal to minus one, 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 diagonal, the diagonal of that. Right? That is the metric there. So we know that the metric tensor will exist everywhere on the manifold because the metric tensor is a tensor field. But whatever that metric tensor field is, at this point, its value is equal to this. So the way to think about that in terms of the work we've done in the previous um, lecture is we have our space-time coordinates, right? We know we have a metric tensor field. Right? It's a function of space-time. So now we know that at every single point in space-time, at every single point in space-time, you can create a new set of coordinates, a new coordinate transformation that will take that at that particular point, say that point's P, G A alpha beta at the point P is going to equal, well, it's going to be G0, 0, 0 equals negative 1, G11 1, 1 equals 1, G1, G2, 2 equals 1, G3, 3 equals 1, and the rest are 0. So I can always find a coordinate transformation such that this is true at the point P. And in fact, we can even go a little bit farther and we can say we can always find a coordinate transformation such that this is true at the point P and, and, Furthermore, g alpha beta with a derivative with respect to uh, space or respect to the coordinates, so I'll say gamma, that equals zero. For, so all the first derivatives are zero of the metric tensor components, and the metric tensor components equals the Minkowski metric components at each point in space-time. And that's what this means, right? You're freely falling, this freely falling condition looks to you like absolutely flat space-time, right? There's no, there's nothing you can do to, uh, 
tell the difference. Therefore, you believe you are in the space-time of special relativity. And the metric of the space-time of special relativity is eta alpha beta, minus 1, 1, 1, 1. Therefore, whatever coordinate system you were using before, or whatever coordinate system, say, he's using, you can find a coordinate system where you believe that the metric right at you, your, your calculation of the metric at your location is minus 1, 1, 1, 1. His calculation will be different if he uses a different coordinate system. It's as simple as that. Now, the physics of everything is always going to be the same because these coordinate changes don't mean anything. All the laws of nature must comply or must be identical in every coordinate system. Therefore, they must all be tensorial. And that is yet another assumption, right, is that uh, the nature of general covariance, all the laws of nature must be the same. But the Einstein equivalence principle, that's this idea of this, of the freely falling elevator being the same as the guy in regular straight up inertial motion of special relativity, the uniformly excelling elevator being identical to the um, uh, uh, earthbound elevator. Um, all of these things, what they really mean is that we can make coordinate transformations that will take any point in the space-time. Uh, you know, I, I, I illustrate it as uh, points on these free-falling paths. I, I kind of said, okay, you're on a free-falling path through space-time. Well, at every point on that path, you should be able to make a translation, uh, coordinate change so you feel like you're in Minkowski space, regular space of special relativity. But it's true for every point in, um, in space-time. At every point in space-time, you can create a free-falling coordinate system that looks exactly like Minkowski space. And therefore, that, tra and that transformation exists from whatever coordinate system you're using to one that is absolutely flat right in the immediate vicinity of, um, of that point. And exactly flat means this equals this, 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 and this, and also the first derivatives are equal to zero. You can't get the second derivatives to be zero, by the way. You can only get the first derivatives to be zero. And of course, it's always an approximation because, hey, the second derivatives aren't zero, right? So, you know, you are limited to being local for this coordinate system to have all this true. This metric will only equal these values at the point P, literally. So any deviation from P, they're not quite the same. So you have to shrink your lab to a point where you can't notice those differences in order to really sort of live through this kind of experiment if you're going to try to, to experience that kind of experiment. You have to really shrink your lab down. Now, understand this is by no means obvious, right? That's, that's the key here is that if I were to do this in our general terms, I said, okay, here's our manifold, and we have G uh, alpha beta, and say we use the full-on notation of our previous dx alpha tensor product dx beta. And this is a, a field, right? So this is the coordinate basis, and these are... Uh, these are the components, and it's a field, so it's a function on the space-time, where x is just shorthand for x mu, which is itself shorthand for x0, x1, x2, x3, like that. So this has a value, meaning there's 16 numbers that have a value at this point p. And what the Einstein equivalence principle says is that I can always find a coordinate transformation where I now switch to new coordinates, these red coordinates, and at the point P, in the new coordinate system, G, al oops, G alpha prime beta prime at the point P, actually what I'll do is I'll, um, instead of making this, I'll say XP, right? So in this case, I'll say XP prime, right? So it's at the, still at the same point, it's at the same point, but in the new coordinate system, right, dx alpha, dx beta, where this is all the new coordinate system, the value of this at that point is going to be negative 1, 1, 1, 1, and all the rest, 0. The diagonal, they like to say diag. Basically, we're meaning the diagonal elements of this thing. I don't like thinking of the metric as a matrix. That's a real bad idea. 
So I'm just trying to say 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. I'm saying G0, 0, G1, 1, G2, 2, and G3, 3 equals minus 1, 1 equals 1 equals 1. I can always find a coordinate transformation that will make that happen for this point. And furthermore, it can make the derivatives of these guys with respect to the spatial coordinates. It can make g alpha, alpha prime, beta prime, gamma prime equal zero for all those coordinates. The fact that that can be done, that, you know, I mean, think about this, right? We're, we're talking about, uh, in the, the black coordinates, we're saying, okay, here's our manifold. We've got a metric. And I told you in the last lesson, we, you know, these metrics can be arbitrary. Um, mathematically speaking, you can create all kinds of metrics. But the fact that I'm allowed to make a coordinate transformation so that every point will always have a metric of this type, that is uh, a, um, a bit more of a constraining statement. I have to make sure that uh, for every point I can make this coordinate transformation and shove my metric into this form. Um, you know, for example, uh, and there's only a limited number of possible forms that a metric can be. There's, I mean, there's not, there's not that many, right? That you could be Euclidean where they're all plus signs, or you can imagine a minus, whoops, you can imagine a minus, minus, you can imagine an extra minus sign, right? You can imagine two minuses and two plus signs or something like that. But, um, but that's not the metric of, of, of uh, special relativity. The metric of special relativity is one minus sign and three plus signs, or one plus sign and three minus signs. You can take the full negative, right? But it's not plus, 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 plus. That would be Euclidean. But either way, the Einstein equivalence principle is basically asserting that you can make that transformation for any point in space-time, and it's kind of important. All right, so where this is all headed, and we'll start beginning it next lecture when we talk about geodesics, is ideally... Our goal is to find out, well, our first goal is to find out this function. I want to know, given, given a space-time, and when I say given a space-time, mean, I mean given a metric. Given a metric, if I'm given a metric, and I have a particle, a test particle, freely falling in space-time that has this metric, I want to know what is its path. And that is asking, how do I take this parameter from R1, map it into the manifold through this function, and I will get coordinates for each of these points, right? And remember, those coordinates were laid down on the space-time because space-time is a manifold, right? Space-time is a manifold. So that allows me to know there's coordinates here. I can find these coordinates, or I, or I can establish the existence of these coordinates. And I know that there's a path, right, because this is physics, right? There's definitely a path of the particle, and I can parameterize the path one way or another. And I'm going to actually parameterize it with the proper time of the particle. Eventually, you'll, we'll see that next time. And um, my goal is to calculate this. Given this metric, calculate this path calculate these functions. And we're going to do that um, for uh, the metric of the Schwarzschild space-time. We're going to do this for the metric uh, surrounding a black hole or a very, very dense star. And uh, we're going to calculate these paths. And it's not, it's going to start easy, but I'm going to, I'm going to push it to as far as I can. Um, but that is, that to me is the, is, is kind of the goal, right? I want to be able to calculate these functions. I want to know. You tell me what time it is according to this guy and I'll tell you where it is I'll tell you where he is now it is interesting when I what about this he tells me what time it is the particle tells me what time it is but now I've got my own clock right because I've got a coordinate system that has a time coordinate an x0 coordinate I have to define what that means but this is definitely this is the relationship between coordinate time coordinate time and proper time, right? That's what this function is. It's the relationship between, as proper time ticks, how does coordinate time tick? Does coordinate time tick slower or faster than proper time? <clears throat> and um, uh, so that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the interesting one. 
The other ones are pretty easy. X1 is just, well, where are you on the X1 axis when the test particle's own clock clicks a certain number? Of course, I could also ask, where am I on the X1 axis when the lab clock clicks its own number, right? So this, uh, this might be more apropos to a sort of a lab observer, a lab clock and uh, a lab location. So, but, but ultimately, if I have this, then I get this, and then I can calculate this without much trouble. So this is really it. If I can do all this, I'm in really great shape. Um, but in general relativity, what is important to understand is that the proper time is always going to be the time as ticked off by the clock of somebody floating through space-time. Whether they're in free fall, whether they're in some kind of accelerated motion, doesn't matter. The clock built into the little, the little uh, test object, that oscillator and that counter, will always click the proper time. The coordinate time, however, in special relativity, the coordinate time was always the time of some sort of laboratory, right? You would have a laboratory that's sitting still, and they would say it's time t and x, and then there would be some moving thing, and uh, there's a moving lab or a moving frame with a move with speed relative, uh, a relative speed of v, right? And you would go through all of these exercises with, you know, uh, how, what's the Lorentz contraction and the time dilation of such a thing. And if you really know what you're doing, you understand that the coordinates, the uh, coordinate uh, transformation is this sort of slanted coordinates, x1 prime, x0 prime. This t really should be an x0, right? And, and, this, and, and these coordinates sort of bend inward, right? And then, but light is always going at a 45 degree angle. Um, but the point here is that in special relativity, this lab time is always the proper time of a guy standing in a laboratory. And the time on uh, the, the proper time of this guy moving is always the proper time, the time ticked off by a clock guy moving with that frame. The problem is that in general relativity, you can always establish a proper time of some test particle. That never changes. But this coordinate time may not actually be the proper time of any particular observer, right? We may choose time coordinates that don't tick off on anybody's clock. In fact, uh, there's this set of coordinates called Penrose coordinates, right? That have a clearly have a time coordinate. I'll call it an x zero coordinate. But there's nobody in the universe whose clock ticks at some at the rate of Penrose time. Likewise, um, Edelston, Edel, uh, well, there's these coordinates associated with uh, uh, black holes. Um, Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, right? I, I gotta remember exactly what they're called. Um, but again, it's they're a very useful coordinate system, right? It it's a coordinate system where the event horizon of a black hole um, is essentially meaningless, and all you have all of these coordinate lines that just cross the event horizon without any trouble whatsoever. And um, they're a beautiful coordinate system, but the time axis on that thing, the time axis doesn't represent the ticking time of any particular observer in the universe. It is just a mathematical construction that provides a time axis that is indeed time-like, um, which is something we'll discuss when we get to it, but uh, it doesn't necessarily match anybody's particular clock. And that's an important distinction. It's an abstract distinction, and it's hard to make that jump from special relativity, where just about every time you see is attached to somebody. But in general relativity, that's not true. There's nobody. These weird cosmological diagrams you'll get in special relativity, these Penrose diagrams, nobody um, actually has a clock that ticks that way. Okay, so what did we cover? Um, I just went back to the beginning. Uh, we just covered this idea that I want you to think about, I want you to think about motion in space-time as literally in space-time. You should always have that time coordinate in there, and you're always understanding this motion as as nothing is stationary. Everything is moving, and everything's moving along their world line at the velocity c, right? And um, uh, that can never change. It can never change, by the way, because the four velocity, the four acceleration, right? You can calculate the four acceleration is the derivative of the four velocity with respect to 
proper time, right? This is all special relativity, right? That for acceleration, if you calculate a mu v mu, which would be the projection of the four acceleration on the four velocity, that's always zero. It's, it's kind of a tricky calculation, actually, because if you write down this in full generality, which would be this here, then you have to calculate this by taking derivatives of each of these terms with respect to tau, right? And, you know, you have to, so you have to do, like, d gamma d tau, and it can be done. It's not, it's not totally tricky. It's just you've got to keep track of things. But by the time you calculate this and you execute this, you're going to get a zero. And um, so no acceleration in the universe can change your four velocity because all acceleration is forever orthogonal to four velocity. So that's the way I want you to think about movement in general relativity. Always think about it in the context of, um, of moving through space-time. Um, space-time is a four-dimensional manifold. We talked about that. And in addition, it has a metric structure such that at every point in the four-dimensional manifold, you can erect, you can erect coordinates that are free-fall coordinates. And that's the Einstein equivalence principle, another key assumption that Einstein realized was very, very important here. Um, and with those points in mind, you, you, the mathematical manifestation of that is you can always get this transformation to transform away the metric to a very, very simple metric. And you can do it at every point where you lose, where the metric becomes very simple and all of its derivatives vanish, first derivatives vanish. Uh, not its second derivatives, but its first derivatives will vanish. I guess the, the other important point here is that if you can make a single transformation so that every point, so that g alpha beta of x equals minus one, 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 one for all x, if you can do that, then you have special relativity, right? Then you have flat space, right? Um, there's no curvature whatsoever. So if you can make a single transformation that'll turn everything into this metric at every point, you have flat space time. Um, and so uh, uh, keeping that in mind, then ultimately our goal is to calculate these world lines. And calculating the world lines means finding these functions, meaning as the proper time of an object moving on the world line ticks off, how does the motion look in any given coordinate system? Okay, so that's all for now. A little rambling, but that's sort of to get us warmed up into how to think about what's going on.